Jenny was saying, I come from a background in scientific computing on Next Machines, and that's where I was introduced to Objective-C. And as much as I love programming in Objective-C, it's an awkward language to do scientific programming in. And I'm really getting a kick out of doing scientific programming in Swift. And I will try to show you why and also introduce some tips about it. So Swift is a general purpose language. But then again, so is C++ and so is Python, and they act in this area successfully. In fact, you could use any language to do scientific programming. Uh, but it's all about what that language brings to the table in order for the researchers and developers who are using it. Now, most scientific programming uh, is done in one of these environments. However, researchers, they're usually not making applications for end users. Uh, Swift adds a unique choice in this mix. Swift's a, it's a young language, but it's maturing quickly. It doesn't have the scientific libraries of these other languages, but it's sitting on top of a set of tools for high-performance computing that it can use right now. So often the goal is to mix research and empirical data, as well as being able to call out to high-performance libraries, so that in Swift we can produce high-quality scientific applications. There is never going to be such a thing as an import science. Uh, scientific computing is not one thing. It's a broad class of techniques, and it's very domain-specific. And you need a language where you can roll your own solutions as you need them. First, I'm going to start with a short aside about Unicode. You can feel free to ignore, ignore all of this, but it's 2019, and we're all living in the future now. So it might be time to be a little bit bold. And besides, nothing I'm going to show you here hasn't been done in the 1970s and 1980s. And aside from being beautiful, Unicode can create code that is both more understandable and more debuggable. Now, the, this is a set of characters that is on your keyboard that you can use as operators right now. It's not a great selection, and most people will maybe use one or two of these. In principle, Unicode should be giving us the opportunity to make our code look like our concepts. And when some of you heard that Swift was going to allow Unicode in source, may, many of you opened up this rarely used character palette and went shopping. And suddenly, you had a desire to make a navigation app. And it was primarily just so you could use that operator in a line of code. <laughs> but here's what your coworkers are afraid of you doing. However, that's not what I'm talking about. This is more what I'm talking about, making your code look like your math. And this is more relevant to some areas than others. But this you can type without lifting your hands from the keyboard. There's a little trick on Macs in there. You can do this on other platforms as well. In the keyboard settings, you can add another keyboard, even if it's not your native tongue. And you can use the caps lock key to toggle back and forth between this uh, language. So in my case, I use Greek, and I can toggle just by hitting that key. And as well, Xcode allows us to make uh, extensions to Xcode. And when you make an ex ex Xcode extension, you can also attach a hotkey using the standard mechanism in the preference panel. And in this case, those little dots in the upper right-hand corner of some of the letters uh, you achieve by uh, hitting Option H on the keyboard, and it produces this little dot. I noticed it wasn't being used, so I made an Xcode extension that makes use of this, and when I hit the hotkey, it turns that equation into this. So I'm not just using the Greek letters, but here I'm reaching way out into Unicode space for unusual characters that mean something in the context, in this case, of vectors and matrices. It allows you to produce code that looks like this, without lifting your hand from the keyboard. And it's very mathy looking, but this is very clean code. And if we were to use longer method names, it would only distract from the understanding of the equations. And so within its domain, this is very clear and debuggable code. So there's a common starting stack that you might build up when starting a some kind of scientific programming, where you might have a set of math primitives, maybe modeling objects, and uh, some way to encapsulate your empirical data. 
And it's important that you be able to uh, swap these things in and out if you decide to change either your data sets or how you're going to do your models because it's never the same as when you start a project. And so you need to build in some kind of flexibility to uh, swap them out. And in Swift, often the two types of objects that people uh, consider are structs and classes. And the big difference for scientific computing tends to be the pass by value versus pass by reference aspect of this. And especially if you start extending these classes to include things like, say, in the case of this run, the, the runner object, we might have a set of races where we're collecting biometric data. There might be a gigabyte of data in there. And all of a sudden, you need to start considering how much does my data weigh and what are the consequences of passing something by copy. Um, and once you pass the data to a function, what's going to happen to that data? Because it, it may go to any number of uh, functions from there. And if it's light, structs are often the best opportunity for performance. Um, but you need to think about the lifespan of your data throughout your program. Now, Swift also has these enormously powerful enums. They start by looking like a C enum, where you have uh, cases, like normal. But in our case, we can extend these to have types. They can be multiple types involved to store values. They can be generic types. And you can even label them. You can even make the enums conformant to a protocol. In this case, we're saying that electronics objects have to be shortable I'm not, for some reason. And you can extend them to be recursive, even. So in this case, we have a sub-circuit that can be a collection of uh, components. And if you use the indirect keyword, this adds an extra layer of indirection to the compiler, making this possible. And all of a sudden, now you have some way to store a very rich set of data. You can make convenience initializers. And even though you can't add uh, uh, properties to uh, enums, you can add computed properties. And you can nest these enums and nest them within structs or within classes. And this gives us a very rich set of data opportunity in addition to the structs and classes. I will say uh, the downside of using enums are a couple of things. Uh, one is that if you're going to address the values that you've stored in your enum, uh, you have to use some kind of switch statement like this to do the, uh, where you do a case let syntax to get it. Or if you're only going to bother considering one of the cases, there's this syntax that goes if case let. Both of these are a little awkward, and it's a little more wordy than dealing with things when they're in structs or in classes. And then the other thing is that if you want to examine a data set that you've stored in a recursive enum, you have to start from the top down and recurse down. And if you want something more sophisticated, then you'll have to build that out inside of a struct or a class. And next, I'll get to actually doing something with these objects. But I need to make a note that we write algorithms and we build up sets of tools that get results. But only at an approximate level are we ever doing actual math. We have tools, which we call doubles and floats and ints, and they all conform to some IEEE standard. But if you type this into almost any language, you'll find that this is false. And it's because it's not exactly true. So we say, OK, floating point, we'll play your game. And we'll override an approximately equal to sign. And we'll say, that's got to be true. Because trying to tell the compiler, you know what I mean. Tell me if these two things are equal. And then you could even make this content context sensitive by setting a tolerance of some kind within different contexts in your program so that it means different things in different places. And as a little example of building out something, this is just a simple example where we have a quadratic equation where we all learned that this is the solution to a quadratic equation. And I'd like to turn this into real code. These are all typable symbols here. So I'm going to say the solutions are this, and I'm going to turn those things into real working operators. So we start, with our, uh, we start backwards by looking at our uh, source code that we would like to exist. And we create a couple of operators, a prefix operator and an infix operator. Uh, the plus minus does what you think it would do, returns two uh, numbers coming back. And what I'm going to do is, in this case, I'm going to make an enum called number, which can be either real or complex, but not both, because I know that in some cases, I'm going to get a complex result for that quadratic equation. 
And so the only downside of any time you decide to make your own object like this is you've got to take care of the operators that make this algebra actually happen. So that's kind of the pain. But each of these functions is fairly easy to write. This is the complete code for the adding two uh, numbers together. You do have to take care of the four cases because they're, both numbers can be either type. But this is the operator where your result might start out as a real number, but come back as a complex number when you take the square root. So here we have working Swift code, finally, where when we give it a set of values, like th this set of uh, coefficients, we end up with a pair of real numbers. And if we give this set of coefficients, we come back with a pair of complex numbers. You can imagine the complex number being generated in that screw root sign in the middle ends up infecting everything that interacts with it from there on, and the, the complex number kind of bubbles out of the equation. This is a more complicated uh, example, and it leans more into the functional side of Swift. And don't worry about if you don't know these symbols or if it's been too long since you've seen them. But if f is a function that takes a coordinate and returns a value, so it's a field of some kind in space. And there's an operator operating on this function, which takes a thing that takes a coordinate and returns a double, and it returns a different thing that takes a coordinate and returns a double. And this is, you can already see why functional programming is not widely adopted. The syntax gets haywire. And everything in here has to have that kind of signature. And it's got to ultimately return this thing that takes a coordinate and returns a double. So this is where type aliases can really save everybody who's working on this project. So we make a type alias for a scalar field so that we can say the function is merely that. And now everything in the parenthesis merely takes a scalar field to a scalar field. But we can make it one step easier with another type alias and call that thing an operator. And now we're starting to talk about stuff, and you can even forget that it's functional uh, programming that you're doing. So we have this equation, and we can set up, there are mul many different ways to attack this problem. Here I'm going to make an enum called axis, which has four cases, x, y, z, and time. And I'm going to make a type alias for my coordinate, which simply associates a double with each axis. So this is a, a cute way of getting a coordinate. And here are, are our two type aliases. And lastly, um, that curly function is a partial differential function that takes one of the axes that you give it and produces an operator. So here we're even going one step further with our functional programming. And same with this gradient function that takes an axis and returns an operator. So now, and, and everything inside of that parenthesis had to be able to inter interact. So we make these functions here that creates an operator algebra. And we end up with this bit of code here, where I just made some kind of function that takes a vector v and returns a double. And when we actually implement it, this is working Swift code right here, where we have the partial function operating on dot t, which is one of the cases in the enum. So it ends up having this notation, just like the gradient operates on that dot x, which is one of the cases of the enum. And it ends up looking almost exactly like the equation we were hoping to be able to put into code. And it has the nice thing that when you actually give it a vector from there, you get your number out. And now you can use it. Now it's time to get some results. So let's say that you, for whatever reason, maybe you're doing audio processing and you're uh, ending up with uh, some kind of signal where you have a lot of complex numbers and you need to simply add these two arrays together. Now, on most platforms, there are high-performance C functions that'll take care of this for you, either on CPUs or on GPUs. And here's a function that's optimized for this need. And because the way Swift lays out its memory, it matches exactly what C wants the memory to be. The memory stride is exactly the same. And so that we can use it exactly as cleanly as C uses it. Now, the downside is we use it exactly as cleanly as C uses it. Um, so you've got these ampersand references, and it's doing a thing where it's mutating one of the arrays that you pass it to give the results back in. 
so you could make an operator overload that cleans this up so that if other people are working on the project, they can nicely use it. Or you could make another one that acknowledges that one of the arrays will mutate, and you actually avoid a copy this way, and it's more performant. So Swift can elegantly call out numerous uh, hardware functions, both on CPUs and on GPUs, on Macs and on Linux. And there are a lot of open source projects doing this kind of stuff on Linux. And perhaps more platforms to come. And the, one other nice thing is that Swift makes it really easy to prototype for these devices that you're going to debug on because, for instance, on a GPU, it's very hard to debug some of these calls when they're happening at 10,000 times at the same time. So here's an example of writing a function in Swift and in Metal. Now, it takes a second to even realize which is which, and I tend to just look for the semicolons, and that's the Metal. And here's a struct. Uh, when you're talking to Metal, you might want to model uh, a set of data that you're passing back and forth between the GPUs. And again, it's almost the same, except some, some of the uh, types are on the other side of the variable, and you have semicolons. And there is a nice little library called SIMD that probably some of you have used, which uh, is a low-dimensional math vectorization library that helps a lot here. Now, in Swift, we really like these higher-order functions, map, filter, reduce, and such. They're like candy. They're, they're very tempting to use everywhere. But if you're looking for high-performance solutions, it's important to know that there are all these uh, high-performance solutions available to you. And in this case, there's a function that will take the sign of an arbitrarily large array for you. And even on relatively small arrays of like 10 elements, you can get an order of magnitude better performance than what Swift is doing. Swift is a fast language, but you can do even better when you make use of these high-performance libraries. And the compiler can be really clever about how it implements map, but it's never going to implement this function for you. So getting back to this example, we have matrices and we have vectors operating on thousands, if not millions, of pieces of data, being hardware accelerated behind the scenes. Swift coordinates the flow of all this data, separating the concerns so that you can keep the science of this really clear. And you're debugging an algorithm here. You're not also debugging the implementation of exactly what's happening with your data behind the scenes. So in terms of the future, there are a few things that I'm looking forward to uh, getting a boost. And most of these things here are in development anyway. So I'm very happy about that. And Apple, for their part, they're um, doing some of the like leading ARM chip design. And soon they'll be designing their own GPU chips. Uh, and they have two great teams at Apple uh, working on both CPU and GPU acceleration, uh, the Metal team and the Accelerate team doing great jobs. And Swift is not just up to the task of scientific computing now, but it gives unique abilities that, for us to make this happen. Thank you very much.